Okay, let's start. We have a, normally I start when I see 20 people here. <laughs> okay, great. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, join today's uh, speaker series. Uh, today is our uh, last uh, event in this semester, and uh, thank you so much for your attending. And today we have uh, <coughs> uh, uh, Dr. Olga Garcia from Mexico to present uh, her research. So um, before we start, uh, like usual, like, please uh, keep your question at the end. Uh, if you can either um, type your questions in the chat box, or you can, uh, you know, turn on your camera and ask a question directly. I, I would encourage you to turn the, the camera and ask your question directly. Uh, so, Dr. Uh, Garcia uh, was born uh, in, in Mexico and she studied uh, chemistry at the, the university, the National University. Uh, uh, sorry, it's a national autonomous university of Mexico, right? and she also studied uh, uh, nutrition and got her master degree and a PhD degree in uh, international nutrition uh, at UC Davis. And right now she is a full professor and a senior scientist at the School of National Science of the Autonomous University at the Corato uh, in Mexico. Her main research uh, is to study the bioavailability of micronutrients and the impact of micronutrients deficiency on health, food security, food security, and food environment. So without a further delay, I will give the podium to Dr. Garcia. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll share my presentation with you. And there you go. Um, well, first, I really want to thank you for inviting me to these seminars, um, for inviting me to be here to share a little bit of what I've been doing for the past 15 or so years. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about one of my passions that are micronutrient deficiencies and their impact on health and what we've studied regarding obesity and parasitic infections and what happens when they coexist together, which is very common in low and middle income countries. Now, um, when I started my PhD over at Davis with um, Dr. Lindsay Allen, our main focus was iron deficiency and their, consequ their health consequences. And the evidence, what the evidence has said for years now is that, and we have it very clear that micronutrient deficiencies Increased morbidity, increased mortality, and in children, it also means that we can have impaired cognition and impaired growth. Now, when I came back to Mexico after studying, things have started to change a little bit. And instead of having high prevalence of stunting, we started to have high prevalence of overweight, overweight and obesity. Um, I studied mainly rural areas and focused on women and children. And you know that right now, Mexico is one of the countries that has the highest prevalence of childhood, childhood obesity. When I started studying it by then, it was just beginning. The problem was just beginning. So one of the first questions when I came back to Mexico was, um, what is happening with the obese population? Um, are they having also micronutrient deficiencies or not? And if they are having micronutrient deficiencies, what are the consequences of these deficiencies? Are they the same when, when, a, when a person is undernourished or they are different? Um, we started with a, a review. This is a, it's, it's almost, I don't know how many years ago I wrote this. And it was pretty clear by then that some studies were suggesting that deficiencies, micronutrient deficiencies might be associated with increased body fat and also were related with contributing with low grade systemic inflammation that is observed in obesity. Consistently in many countries, both developed, underdeveloped countries, obese or people that had overweight and obesity have lower micronutrient concentrations compared to normal weight individuals. 
However, it was not clear by then whether this association was a, a causal relationship or we didn't even know the direction of causality. We thought that micronutrient deficiencies could be contributing to the increase of body fat. Uh, we also thought that obesity could increase the risk of micronutrient deficiencies or both. And now we know that there, it is a combination of both of them. And we also know that it is different depending on the micronutrient. Iron, for example, seems to be more in the second one that obesity increases the risk of its deficiency. But for example, for vitamin A and vitamin E, D, it seems like the first one is what's happening. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Now, um, what was observed by then was that vitamin A was inversely associated with, um, with obesity and body fat in children, but it was positively associated in adults. And this was observed not only in Mexico, but in other countries in the world. Vitamin D, on the other hand, consistently has been associated with obesity and insulin resistance and chronic inflammation across age groups. Most of the studies in vitamin A show that th there is an inverse association between this vitamin and some measures of obesity. Zinc, for example, in India and Korea, is zinc deficiency is considered in these countries a risk factor for obesity. And some studies in the US and Bangalore have observed that if you are overweight and have obesity, you have a higher risk of iron deficiency. And I'll talk a little bit about what, why this is happening later. Now, what did, we do, what did we do in Mexico specifically? And this is uh, one of the, some two of the papers that we published about, we studied almost 600 women from a rural area, and we wanted to know the relationship between this um, obesity and some micronutrients. And also we looked into low grade systemic inflammation. And in the first study, what we saw was that at least for vitamin C, it was pretty clear that the relationship was inverse for, for some markers of, of interest in terms of obesity. So what you see here is that if we have increased leptin concentration, we have low vitamin C because there is an, um, an inverse relationship. And the same thing happened with BMI and with waist to height ratio. However, with vitamin A, though the coefficient is not very high, the, the, it was a significant association, but it was a positive association. This means that leptin, leptin's concentrations are higher when vitamin A concentrations are higher. We further analyzed this data and we wanted to see what was happening in particular with leptin so, and the relationship of, of micronutrients. And this is what happened. In terms of vitamin C and zinc, the relationship was inverse with leptin concentrations when the women had higher BMI and had higher body fat percent, and in the case of zinc, when they had higher waist circumference. In terms of vitamin A concentration and leptin, the, the relationship was a positive relationship, but only in the women that had lower BMI, that had lower body fat percent, and had lower waist circumference. And what happens when we look into markers of inflammation? We measured in the same women, the same cohort of women, but a subsample, we, um, we measured cytokines and we saw that the only micronutrient that was associated in this population with markers of inflammation was zinc. And the, the odds of having high interleukin-6, interleukin-10, and interleukin-12 were lower in those that had adequate zinc concentrations. We then wanted to see if what was happening in children, because these were women, we wanted to know in the same area, rural population, what was happening with children. And we observed something similar with vitamin C. Um, vitamin C concentration was inversely related with abdominal fat percent and was also invers inversely related with body fat percent. We also did some interaction analysis between micronutrients, inflammation, and insulin resistance. And in the first graph, what you're seeing in the dotted line are the, uh, kids that had uh, normal BMI. And in the continued line, we'll, the, the, those represent children with high, higher BMI. And 
This is for the, the children that had normal vitamin A. It didn't matter if they were obese or if they were not obese, but they had lower C-reactive protein. But what happens when vitamin A concentration decreases? The children that had high body fat or were obese had higher CR, CRRP concentrations, and these were adjusted um, interaction models. And there's something, something similar happened with zinc, but with um, insulin resistance. So when the children had normal zinc concentrations, there was really no difference in insulin resistance. But when the children had lower zinc concentrations, insulin resistance increased in the children that were obese. Now, be cautious to interpret this data because these are cross-sectional data, and we know that other factors may be contributing both to C-reactive protein and HOMA concentrations. Now, what were the possible mechanisms of why this is happening? For both vitamin A and vitamin D, it seems that the mechanisms is through their nuclear receptors and their, their functions of cell differentiation. So what has been published is that both vitamin A and vitamin D inhibit leptin expression, they inhibit inflammatory response, and they also increase adipogenesis, some in human and some in animal models. For vitamin E, for example, um, it has been observed that they regulate, they regulate cytokine expression, so it may be an important vitamin for, to reduce chronic inflammation, and also it regulates leptin metabolism. Most of the study done in vitamin C with vitamin C have been done in animal models. There's a group in Spain that's very um, that's very strong in this, and they have um, they have looked at the inhibition of in leptin concentration by vitamin C. And we also there's also been documents that observe uh, that observe the modulation of adipocyte lipolysis through vitamin C also. Now, the B12 and folate has, have been as extensively studied right now in terms of the effect on epigenetics, specifically the methylation of genes. And the, in, in the, 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 the main area of studies, which we have not conducted, have looked at into the, pro, the epigenetic programming of the offspring and how this might increase or lower the risk of obesity and other diseases later in life, basically field programming. Now, what about zinc and iron? In terms of iron, as I mentioned, it, it seems that obesity is the one that is causing iron deficiency that is observed in, in, in obese individuals due to the inflammation that is observed that is associated with obesity. And also, it has been also reported that Iron absorption is reduced in obese individuals, even if we give an iron absorption enhancer such as ascorbic acid. When giving this to obese, to obese individuals, the absorption, the effect of ascorbic acid is half of that in normal weight individuals. Now, in the, the research in zinc and the effect of the relationship it has with obesity is being very new recently because of the transporter proteins that, that we've discovered until recently. These are some examples of some of the ones that, have, that are known to alter zinc homeostasis and thus re be related to obesity. Also research in alterations of zinc finger proteins and alterations in SAG, which is an adipocytokine that all of these have been related with increased risk of obesity and inflammation. Now, the next question that we had is, should we give more micronutrients to overweight and obese individuals? Will it help? And um, this is, oops, sorry, this is a study that, this is not our study, this was a study done in China. This is one in adults. And they gave them calcium plus vitamin D supplements for 12 weeks, and they had a control group, but they didn't receive, I think, I believe they didn't receive anything. And this was in, uh, it, I'm sorry, not adults, in college students that had very low calcium intake. And after 12 weeks, what they observed is that the, the, the students that received the supplement had significantly lower fat mass, significantly lower fat percent, visceral fat mass, and the visceral fat area compared to the control group. 
What we did in Mexico, we didn't give them the supplement just like that. What we did was we added micronutrients to low fat milk. By then, um, there were several papers mentioning the importance of low fat milk as part of a diet to reduce uh, obesity. So we wanted to test it with added micronutrients. And this was a study done in a rural area in Mexico. And what we found after four months of intervention in terms of body weight and BMI, and you can see this in the, in the continue line, this is the group that, is, that received the low fat milk added with micronutrients. After four months, they significantly decreased their body weight compared to the other two groups. The other two groups were low fat milk with no added micronutrients in a control group. And in, the, in this figure in the right, it's the same but with BMI, the group that received the low, uh, the low fat milk added with micronutrients had lower BMI after four months. We wanted to do the same thing with children to see what happened, but here we didn't give them milk. We gave them, we gave them a supplement containing milk proteins and also some micronutrients. And we wanted to see what happened in body composition, in profile and in an inflammation. And, um, we recruited 152 children and we divided them into two groups. The first group received a nutrition education program in addition to the supplement that contained the milk proteins and the macronutrients. And we had a group that received only a nutrition education program. And we followed them for 24 weeks. The supplement contained milk proteins, contained vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, E, iron, calcium, and zinc. And in this group, after 24 weeks, we didn't see any significant differences between the control group and the group receiving the supplement in the anthropometric measurements or the body composition indicators. The same thing happened when we evaluate blood pressure or all the biochemical uh, markers that we evaluated, such as glucose, the profile, some inflammation um, markers, no difference was observed in, in between groups. We hypothesized that this was due to the nutrition education program, which was the, the, the children who responded wonderfully to the, to the nutrition education program. So that could be the reason why we didn't see any differences between the two, both groups. Now, after doing all this, remember that on the first slide, I showed you that micronutrient deficiencies have been associated for a long time with morbidity. So one of the questions that our group uh, formulated was, are the people with obesity that have micronutrient deficiencies, are, get, are they getting sick more often? But specifically, we wanted to talk about parasites. Uh, parasitic infections in Mexico are very, very, very high highly present. The prevalence can be between 40 and 70 percent. And we wanted to see if this, this, what was the relationship between parasitic infections in a population with a high prevalence of obesity, which is our case. And we also wanted to know what, if, if an obese individual is infected with parasites, are the effects the same as a, a, a person that is not obese or even undernourished? So just a brief reminder of intestinal parasites so that um, we're all on the same page. These parasites are organisms that need a host to survive in the GI tract. And there are two groups. The first group are called protozoas, and they are transmitted via fecal oral. And we can find, find two types, the pathogens such as Jardia and the non-pathogens such as Entomedocol. And we also have the other group that's, that are called helminths. The, they are transmitted by contaminated soil, and that is why sometimes they, well, actually, not sometimes, they're usually referred to as soil transmitted helminths, SDH. And the infections occur when we eat, uh, we eat basically the eggs, as it happens with Ascaris lumbricoides, or through skin penetration, which is the case of hookworm. Okay, now what we found, and this we did in children also in rural areas, is that there is a difference of obesity and of obese individuals and non obese individuals in terms of, no, I mean, no, 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 the other way around, it, and in terms of the intensity of their infection and obesity. 
So we divided the population of children in non-infected, light, light infection and moderate or heavy infection. And those children that had a high, moderate and heavy infection of this non-pathogenic um, parasite had higher waist circumference, had higher waist height ratio, had higher body fat, had higher abdominal fat, and in terms of percentage and also in kilograms. And this and not and we didn't see any other any other parasite related with, with obesity. Or Ascalis was related with some of the measures of anthropometric measures, but of the, the other way around with undernourished populations. So the first question that we we asked ourselves was why is this happening? And we have several theories. One of them was that this the infection with this non-pathogenic parasite may maybe changing the diet, or maybe it had an impact on inflammation, both local in the intestine or systematic. We also thought that it could it could be having some something to do with um, micronutrient deficiencies or dysbiosis, alterations in the microbi in the microbiota. So the first thing that we did was look into the diet. Are they eating more or not? And the answer is published, was published in this paper, and the, the answer is yes. The children that were infected with Entamella coli were having um, an increased intake of energy compared to the non-infected, fat, sugars, fruits, legumes, and um, this, it, this difference was significant. And remember, when a person is infected with this pathogen, since it's not pathogenic, there's no symptoms. So we don't know if you're infected or not, just it leaves there. Uh, as that is, for example, it was the other way around. This is very normal. We, there's a lot of information about this reported in the literature when people have Ascaris, are infected with Ascaris, and we, sh we showed the same thing in children. They consume less energy, like less calories, less carbohydrates, in this case, less fruits, and also less sugar. So basically, the children that were infected with Ascaris were eating more. And now I want to go and talk a little bit now about the relationship of micronutrients and parasites. Most of the evidence that's being reported forever, for a long, long time, has focused on undernourished populations and only really a few micronutrients have been studied, basically iron, zinc, and vitamin A because of their importance, they, because they are very important in, in the immune response. And in Mexico, for example, there are, there are plenty of reports of low vitamin A concentrations, for example, when children are infected with diarrhea. In the Northwest and Central Pacific coast of Mexico, Tricuris tricuria infection has been related to low iron concentration. And also in the Northwest, school-age children were, consist, were considered, um, that were infected with um, giardia, were at risk, were considered a risk of zinc deficiency. And the mechanisms are also pretty clear. Decreased appetite because they are infected with parasites, decreased micronutrient absorption. This is due basically because there is gut permeability and the microbiota is completely, the composition is completely altered. We know there is increased intestinal inflammation and that also affects absorption. And there's also increased systemic inflammation and there are increased blood losses. And the effect, on the host varies according to the parasite. For example, infection with Javia and Ascaris have been reported to reduce vitamin A absorption. And on the other hand, we have SDH and Protozoa, oops, sorry, who that have been observed to interfere with iron absorption, increase blood losses, decrease, decrease uh, iron absorption, and increase the risk of um, iron deficiency anemia in children. Now, some of this might or might not happen with, with children with obesity. Now, in the same children that we have been studying for a while now, we wanted to see how many, people, how many of these children had the coexistence of parasitic infections, micronutrient deficiency, and obesity. And approximately 14% of them have the three conditions. And they have, we know that these three conditions have a direct effect on inflammation, both local and systemic. And we know that alterations of the immune response 
and the increased risk of pro-inflammatory cytokines may induce not only obesity, but other non-communicable diseases such as diabetes and hypertension. In, um, we, did this, we just sent this paper for publication, it's in review right now. Um, we wanted to see the interaction between the three of them, micronutrients, body fat, and um, parasitic infections. And in the first, the, the A, the figure A, this is serum retinal concentration, and this we divided the groups with, in parasite free and the ones that were infected with protozoa. And the children that had normal body fat were the children that the, these are the, the circles and the squares are the children that had high normal fat. So when they when they were parasite free, the obese children had higher serum retinal concentrations compared to the normal body fat children. But what happens when they are infected? When they are infected, the children that had obesity decreased their vitamin A concentration. We're not sure why the normal children increased their vitamin A concentrations. Um, this is something that we have to look into. Something similar happened with zinc concentration. When the children were parasite-free, the children that had high body fat had higher zinc compared to normal height. But when they had helmet infection, both concentrations of both the, in both groups, sink, uh, serum sink decreased. Now, what about other micronutrients? Um, there is limited information about other micronutrients. In, in our, we measure um, B12 in, in these children. And what we saw was that by height, the, the children, in, this is, in Mecca, which is in the middle of Mexico, we saw the higher vitamin three, 12 concentrations in, were found in these school age children that were infected again with non pathogen, non pathogenic parasites, which is Antonella coli and uh, Endomimax nana, compared to non infected. Now, all of these that I'm telling you, that we are the first ones to kind of look and started to look and explore about this. So we're not, there's that we need more research to know the effect of parasitic infections on other micronutrients and how are, how, how are these relationships affected by body fat. So in conclusions, deficiencies and low concentrations of micronutrients have been associated with obesity and also inflammation across age groups worldwide. Um, it, it, it seems that it doesn't matter if it's a low, middle, or a developed country. It seems that it happens everywhere. The effect of micronutrient deficiencies on obesity may be fair, depending on the micronutrient, as I mentioned before. It seems that iron is iron deficiency is a consequence of obesity, but vitamin A and vitamin D might be affecting fat uh, body fat content. We need to know more about the use of micronutrient supplements as part of the treatment of obesity and its comorbidities. We need to know what happens with different strategies. Should we give more iron or should we not give more iron? You know that iron is when there's inflammation, it may be no, it may be not useful to give iron in this in such cases. Uh, parasitic infections may contribute to obesity. We're not sure now. Remember, these are not these are cross-sectional studies. This might be probably due to the higher food intake. And with this parasite, non-pathogenic parasites in particular. We also know that micronutrient deficiencies are related to parasitic infections and that the relationship that micronutrients have with parasitic infections may be related differently depending on body fat content of the person. Since these three conditions, obesity, micronutrient deficiencies, and also parasitic infections predispose to various diseases and disabilities, we need to take uh, this into consideration in future health and community programs in Mexico and other countries with similar public health problems, which is basically the rest of Latin America. We're very similar in that sense. Um, I would like to acknowledge the work of my, my team, my human, the Human Nutrition Research Group at the university, and to all my masters and PhD students, this is not only my work, this is the work of everybody that has participated in this, including our women and children. So thank you. I think I went too fast. I'm sorry. This is my email and, this, and my Instagram.
content uh, contact if you, if you wish to contact me privately. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Garcia. Uh, any questions? Yeah, we have a lot of time for questions today. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I, yeah. Okay, so my, when, when people may are maybe thinking of questions, I, I do have one question. So uh, you show uh, at the beginning the associations uh, between those uh, 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 micronutrients and uh, obesity, and you, you saw a study uh, parasite and uh, obesity in Mexico um, children. So I'm curious, uh, so it, it seems uh, there is a causal, the causal link between parasites, micronutrients and obesity, it seems like here. I'm just curious if, if the micronutrients is just a, a, a the consequence, the consequence of a parasite infection in parallel with uh, their obesity factors? Yeah, I agree. Since they are so related, cross-sectional studies are not permitting us to see the causal relationships. You mm -hmm. see, because obesity is related with micronutrient deficiencies. We have observed micronutrient deficiencies in obese individuals. We have observed micronutrient deficiencies when there are parasitic infections. What, what, what the main message that I want to bring here is that when you have obesity, the effect of these two things, the micronutrient deficiencies and the parasitic infections, might be different when there's obesity than when there's not obesity. And, and, and as such, it has to be addressed that way, not as we address undernourished populations or normal weight mm. populations. Got it. Thank you. Uh, oh, there are so many hands there. Okay, I didn't. I, I didn't notice who the first uh, raised the hand. I was just looking from the tile uh, on my screen. Uh, Chris, maybe you are the you are the first one on my on my screen. So you can go ahead. Great. Thank you, Olga, for a great presentation. Wondering if you could talk about the quality of the diet, particularly in the kids, because uh, micronutrient intakes that are low are markers for poor quality diets, potentially, um, you know, high carbohydrate, sugar sweetened beverages, lots of other processed foods that might not, you know, be um, enriched and fortified. So, do you think there's something going on, and do you have dietary intake? Yes, we do have dietary intake information of both the women and the children that we've been studying for a long time right now. Um, and basically, yes, you're absolutely correct. The diets, especially in rural areas, are horrific. I mean, it, it's really, really sad to see that we're losing the typical Mexican diet. And we are, we are in this transition where rural populations are having very high intakes of ultra-processed foods, a lot of sugar, and um, low milk intake. Some... So in some in some places there's still intake of meat, red meat. Some just completely abandoned that um, that because it's expensive and it doesn't get there in their populations. Mm -hmm. So yes, the answer is the diet is poor, and that is also one of the reasons that I I believe we're seeing mm -hmm. these the macronutrient deficiencies in the obese children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just wondered about the relationship. I don't know between as you mentioned, sugar intake and, and parasitic infections, if there's any evidence there. Um, I think we did that analysis. I don't recall right now. Yeah. Well, we, well, we did do the analysis, not at the, with the overall infection population, mm -hmm. but we did see that the ones that had this non-pathogenic uh, parasite, they were having higher intake of sugar. Mm -hmm. I, that, I mean, again, I'm very cautious by saying if that doesn't I know. mean that, I know. This, that this parasite is making them eat more sugar. But yeah, this is something that we that, that we observed that we didn't observe with the children that had ascaris, for example. And we yeah. know that ascaris, what they do is they decrease in general their, their intake. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So B, you are on the second in my screen. I'm second on your screen. Um, thank you very much. I have to say, 
my my brain is racing to catch up with this rich presentation. I'm sorry, I went too fast. No, no, I, I'm a non-biological scientist, and so um, I, I'm just I I appreciated this very much, and I'm still processing it. But I my question I think was similar to Chris's in the the sort of causal pathways and the control for diet, because some of these things cause loss of appetite. Some of these things, it, 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 it wasn't clear, and, and you, you acknowledge the, the directionality. If you have, I'm, I'm just wondering if you have the kind of detailed, like data from 24 hour dietary recalls where you could really take a look and say, are these, is the absorption, you know, controlling for intake, is the serum concentration different, or what are what are the what are the it's sort of endogenous uh, issues that create obesity and might also relate to some of these other things? So I'm, I mean, I think this is an incredibly valuable strand of research, and it seems to me that 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 would be. From my point of view, that would be a really interesting next direction to take it in would be to really incorporate detailed diet um, intake yeah. information. I completely agree with you. And um, just, just, I mean, this is this, this cohort, we've been studying it for, we've been studying them for a while. We even have, and I didn't present it, but we even have data of uh, microbiota composition, which is adding another another uh, variable to the model, you know, how, how micronutrients affect microbiota, how diet affects microbiota, how that affects inflammation, how that affects parasites affecting microbiota. So it's very, it's very complex. And I completely agree with you. I think that the next step, and we have 24 hour recalls and we also have food frequency questionnaires, which we can use and analyze and see what's going on with them. Thank you. Great, uh, Alexandra, go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you. This th again, this is incredibly rich. Um, you know, lo lo lots, lots, lots going on. I especially appreciated the intervention study where you're looking at can you change things. Um, what I'm interested in is all of these variables are associated with poverty, I think, and then also other stressors. And I, I know you didn't necessarily have data on this, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how much variability there is. For the families in your studies in terms of you know economic status other environmental stressors and anything else that might be going on yes i that's a very good question actually and we do have um ses information of all of them in that the groups are very similar because we're talking about a rural area if we move this study to, to urban areas in mexico that would be a completely different story but when we're talking about rural small communities basically everybody's the same and we also have food security information, for example, and they're pretty much the same, um, where they're pretty, pretty insecure. And that's one uh, other reason that they're, they're not having adequate intakes of food. Um, so yes, we do have, they have, they are in, um, they have low SES, they are food insecure. And also some of them we studied just before the pandemia. And I, don't know what happened after that when we're, we're returning to the communities right now to see if how 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 is this affecting again obesity and again and socioeconomical status and so forth. But yes, I'm, I'm I'm sure that there is an effect over there, and I'm sure some of my students have already looked into the analysis of, of this data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for uh, a really intriguing presentation. And, uh, and we'll be digesting this for some time to come. The, uh, uh, and not because of the rate at which you went, it's just because okay. it's so interesting and complicated. Um, I, I have a question about uh, uh, some of the blood measures you have, of, uh, especially of some of the nutrient concentrations in the setting of inflammation. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was, I was, as you were speaking, I was thinking, is it appropriate to try to adjust concentrations for inflammation 
or would that be over controlling given that inflammation may be part of the causal pathway? Um, so I'd just be curious about what you think about that. And my, my other question is uh, that maybe in the animal studies, were there other measurements besides blood measurements of nutrients such as tissue concentration, say of zinc or vitamin A in liver, et cetera? Yes, uh, I'll address the, the last question first. Yes. In animal models, I don't work with animals, but in animal models, they do. They do have other the measurements in other tissues, even even in um, even in bone. They, they they measure bone and they measure everything. And basically, they they have found that's why they're studying the mechanisms in animal models. It's easier, and they have measured yes other other tissues. We can't, of course, so we have to rely on the old-fashioned way. And we know that some of the markers that we use are not ideal, but that's that's life in terms of, of when we study when you study micronutrients. This is what we have, and this is what we do. Now, in terms of the, I I, I see where you're going with adjusting some of the measures when we wanted to see the effect of micronutrients directly on obese measures. We did adjust for inflammation and so forth. No, if we wanted to see the effect of the micronutrients only on inflammation, then we have to adjust for obesity and, and so forth. And, and, but, but again, it's hard because inflammation might be in the pathway of the, the causal pathway of explaining why micronutrients are related to obesity. It might be through inflammation. As, as, as you mentioned, it's very complex. And I've had students trying to make pathways of what has been going on. And just for vitamin C, it's incredibly complex. So it, as you can imagine, doing it by every single micronutrient, there's there's a story because each one of them be, behaves differently. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ed. There uh, one question from uh... In the chat box, um, let me see. And I really. I'll, uh, I'll read it. Right. Would oh, you okay. say that the treatment for parasitic infection? Oh, that's a good one. And I, I'm, I'm very glad that you asked that one because, and there's a reason why I didn't, we didn't continue our studies giving deworming treatment. I don't know if you know this, but there's, there's, and this I didn't know until I started discussing this with my colleagues at the microbiology department in, at the university. And they mentioned that they wouldn't recommend suggesting deworming treatment to obese individuals just for the obesity, because right now there's a problem with resistance of deworming treatments. And um, we shouldn't be using them cautiously. Twice a year is the final recommendation. However, in the populations that we study, dewarming is part of the national program and they do it to children twice a year, but only the children. And you know, in this context, giving them only the treatment only to the children doesn't mean anything. It's like not giving them anything because they live in the same household with people that are not dewarmed. So two months later, everybody's contaminated. This is why the paralysis of um, parasitic infections in Mexico and other Latin American countries are really high. So for now, I would not recommend, just for now, um, just dewarming everybody, every obesity as a recommendation, um, just the normal thing, you know, twice a year, and that what the whole family, even the pets. Thank you. Got it. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, uh, and in, in the presentation, you, you mentioned in the early of, of the presentation, you mentioned like one type of mechanism would be the epigenetics. And ah, yes. you also uh, mentioned there are some papers, for example, on B, vitamin and uh, DNA isolations. So uh, uh, I see some of those of the papers, but it seems the correlation is not very strong. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, uh, do you have the data on, on the intervention trials and you have blood measured uh, a couple of times and um, isolation can be measured 
and, and if uh, that uh, may be possible to measure that uh, DM isolation change. Yeah, I think that's that's a good that, that's a good question. Um, well, you know, B twelve and folate have been studying a while now because of their methylation, the, 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 their involvement in the methylation processes. And you know that one of the epigenetic modifications, one of the most famous ones, is basically methylation. So it makes sense to study them. Um, the, the most of the information that I've seen regarding B12 and folate have been on fetal programming. However, in the study that I mentioned that we did, we gave them the, the in children, we gave them the protein, the protein um, supplement with added with micronutrients. I regretted this. We didn't add B12, but we did measure B12. Mm -hmm. um, we haven't announced, finished those analysis yet, so we are going to we, we're going to kind of know what happens with B12 concentration. And we also extracted DNA, and we have the um, we we can know specifically the effect of supplementing with B12 in these children in the epigenetic changes. So if you invite me again, I'll probably be able to share with you that information soon. It will be very interesting to see that the interpretation of the B12 can, can affect methylation scatters. Yes. I'm, I'm looking forward to see the result. Yes. And <laughs> you know what happened here. with folate? It was different. There were lower concentrations of B12 in the population, but folate, no folate deficiency at all. Yeah. Actually, we did this analysis with um, Lindsay Allen over at USDA. Mm -hmm. And she was surprised because the the mesh the concentrations in blood of our children surpassed the ability of the equipment to detect it. We couldn't. We don't know exactly what what is the concentration of folate of these children because it was so high. Um, so this mm -hmm. is something. That she, of course, she's very interested in that because she likes all, all the B twelve and vitamin B two concentrations, and we're exploring that also. Okay. That that probably becomes the, the, the enrichment of the, the, the food. Exactly. Uh, we, we may not need that much. So this is, this is something interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see another question from Alan. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for this really fascinating presentation. I keep thinking about 50 years ago, we would be looking at similar populations that were underweight for age exactly. and also stunted. And my question is whether there is that, whether you have that kind of comparative data, is anyone doing those kinds of comparative historical studies in your direct area? And also whether there are comparative studies with Central America, where a country such as Guatemala has been considered to be, have the most stunted under five children, under, <clears throat> under five years age children, um, principally because of these multiple loads, including the parasitic loads. And also there, where they also have um, very controversial vitamin A fortified sugar. Sugar, mm -hmm. I agree. And the, the answer is, I don't believe there is um, in this kind of comparative analysis. Um, in Mexico, the, the, what, what happened in Mexico was that the prevalence of obesity was increased so rapidly that people kind of forgot that there was, they were still stunting and they were still undernourished populations. So everything went to the obese populations. And now, it is true in the areas, for example, that I've studied from 20, 15 years ago to now, studying has decreased significantly, and obesity has increased significantly. But there, there's no, I don't, I don't believe there's no, there, there's anybody comparing the data historically and seeing what's going on in terms of, of that. And I don't think in Guatemala either. I would love to do to do these kind of studies in other places of Latin America. Uh, to see what's going on. I remember um, Kate Dewey telling me that when I first started to tell her about this, this research and she said that they're starting to see the same thing that I saw in Mexico years ago. They're starting to see this in Africa, for example, which is very interesting. Other countries are catching up. So we are kind of, in Mexico, what's going on in Mexico of all these combinations, weird combination of deficiencies and obesity and parasitic infections, we are way ahead of some countries. And this this could be an example of what, we could be an example of what's going on and what's gonna happen in some other parts of, of the world. 
I know I didn't answer your question, Ellen, but the answer is we don't have information and we, we can't compare to other countries because nobody has been doing this um, like we did. So, great. Any other questions? Oh, Beatrice, uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's stunting has decreased. I'm sorry. Stunting decreased. has decreased, obesity has increased. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? No more questions? Okay, we have very good presentation and a very good discussion. You. I, I, I like you, you know, you gave us opportunity to ask questions. Thank you so much for your help. Thank you. And if anybody wants to contact me, uh, Lisa, I think, has my email and everything, and he can contact me and write me, and I'll be more than happy to, to get in touch with everybody. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much for your talk. Great. Gracias. Bye. Bye bye. Great. And also, thank you so much for everyone attend the meeting. Okay, great.